In this video, we're going to do a crash course on KSP equilibrium. Now, this is part of the general equilibrium um, unit, so you will be tested on this whenever you take the general equilibrium test as well. <clears throat> So where I want to get started here is just a quick introduction on KSP. So what KSP stands for is solubility product equilibrium. And what that means is basically we're taking a solid and we're dissolving it in some solvent. So the thing that we are dissolving, that's called your solute, S-O-L-U-T-E. And the thing that we're dissolving the stuff in, that is known as your solvent. S-O-L-V-E-N-T. So that's what we're dealing with solubility. Now at the very beginning of the class this year, we talked about solubility rules. This was in our stoichiometry unit. And so just a quick review on those solubility rules. Um, group 1 metals and nitrate compounds. So when a group 1 metal and a nitrate is in a compound, we classify that as soluble. So what the term soluble means is basically when I put that solid into my container here, it will break up into its ions. And when it breaks up into its ions, we call that aqueous. So it's soluble if it does break up into its ions. Strong acids and strong bases also fall, fall into this category as being soluble. So these guys are always soluble. They will always break into their ions. Group 17 compounds and sulfate compounds, however, have exceptions. So group 17 compounds are soluble except when there was silver, mercury, or lead. So if I have a group 17, and, and just to give you, you might say, okay, what does group 17 mean? This is like your fluorine, your bro, uh, chlorine, your bromide um, column that you have there. Okay, so that's the group 17 on the periodic table. So if I have any of those group 17s with silver, mercury, or lead, what we classify it as is insoluble. Insoluble means that it will not break up into its ions. Instead, it will form a precipitate in my solution here. Sulfate compounds also have exceptions. So sulfate compounds are generally soluble, except when there was silver, mercury, or lead. Notice that these guys appear again. We call these the heavy metal bad guys. And you also have calcium, strontium, and barium that fall in this category. So if a sulfate is with any of these six, then we classify it again as insoluble. And what that means is it forms a precipitate in my solution. All right, so a couple of terms here, right? What does soluble mean? It means that it's going to split apart into its ions. What does insoluble mean? Insoluble means that it will not split into its ions and instead form a precipitate, which is a solid that appears in the solution. Um, other uh, terms that you might need to know is solute. So that's the thing being dissolved. Solvent the stuff doing the dissolving. And once your solute and your sol uh, solute and your solvent are mixed, they become together a solution. All right, so a couple of terms that we need to know. Now, when you write your KSP expressions and during this whole entire KSP unit, you don't necessarily treat it differently as your um, regular KC, regular KP things. So you're still writing your KSP expressions the same way. The only thing that's a little different is that <clears throat> it's, it's a specific type. So specifically when you're working with KSP, you will always have a solid as your reactant and it will break, be breaking into its ions as aqueous things that we have here, here because we're talking about solubility. Um, Remember, pure solids and pure liquids are never included in any K expression. So that's why this K expression here is just my products raised to its coefficients. All right. So same thing as I would be writing for KC. Um, we do use brackets because we are working with molarities. But because the these reactants are always going to be solids, that's why they're not included into my K expressions. Now, also, um, similar but a little bit different than um, uh, the KC expressions, when we solve for X, so let's say we have a rice chart going on here, and I'm going to fill out a rice chart real quick. These solids do not um, pertain in the rice charts at all. 
okay? Initially, you always have zero for your ions, for your products. So this one here will be plus 3x. This one here will be plus 2x. So the way that you work your rice charts are exactly the same way as you would work your, um, your rice charts for just general equilibrium. So the Kc, the Kp, and all of that. So you start with zero initially. The three is from the coefficient. The two here is from the coefficient. You have your x expressions. The only thing that might look a little bit different is that since I do have a solid here, it is not included in any of my rice chart, any of my k expressions. Now, when I solve for x, okay, in x for just regular kc, we just said, hey, this is like the factor that is changing by. Well, it has a specific name when we're talking about ksp, and that name stands for, or that x value stands for solubility. Now, solubility can be represented in one or two different ways, okay? It can be represented as molarity. So since I'm working with molarity concentrations in my rice chart, then when I solve for x, that value will be in terms of molarity. You could also figure out solubility in the term of grams, or in the form of grams, I should say. Now, if I'm trying to figure out this value of x, meaning solubility in grams, what I will have to do is once I solve for x, let's just say x is equal to 1 times 10 to the negative 3 molar. I'm just giving it a value here. If I solve for that, all right, you see how it's already in molarity when I solve for x, so that would take care of number one. But if they don't want solubility in molarity and they instead want solubility in grams, I just refer to stoichiometry stuff that we've already been doing before. So molarity will have to first get into moles, so we say molarity times volume in liters would be equal to moles. And once I figure out how many moles that I have, all I have to do is use my molar mass, which is grams per mole, and that will give me my answer for solubility x in terms of grams. Now one question you might be asking is, all right, well, what molar mass do I use? Do I use the phosphate ion, the calcium ion, or do I use this solid? Well, solubility means the molarity of your solute or the grams of your solute. So your solute is the solid that you're starting with. So you use the molar mass of this solid here, okay? So it's very easy to transfer between the two. What if they give me grams and I have to figure out um, and plug in X to maybe solve for a K or something. Well, I would use grams. I would convert to moles, convert from moles to uh, molarity by dividing by liters, and then that would give me the value of X there. So I've seen this question lots of different times, especially in free response. Know how to convert between molarity of solute for solubility to grams of solute for your solubility. Know how to convert those back and forth. And don't forget, obviously, your stoichiometry and your rice chart. Now, a couple of other things that I've seen here. Um, this is just like when we were talking about stuff that's given for your rice charts um, in the KC and KP portion. They could, A, give you a K value, and if they're giving you a K value, they more than likely want to want to um, you to figure out what solubility is, or want you to figure out what this equilibrium value is. Okay, so you can answer either of those questions. If they do not give you K, then they will have to give you either an equilibrium value of one of these. So they might say the phosphate ions concentration is blah, blah, blah. Well, if you know the phosphate ions concentration, then you will be able to solve for the calcium ions concentration. It's very similar to giving you the equilibrium value, you using that to solve for the K value.
They could also give you solubility. So they could give you the molarity. They could give you X. They could say the solubility is blah, blah, blah. Or they could give you the solubility in grams. So those are usually the ways that they like to represent um, KSP in the form of rice charts. So you're either trying to solve for a K or you're trying to find solve for solubility, or you're trying to solve for one of these x value or one of these equilibrium values. So either way, um, you guys will always have the means to do that as long as you know how to set up a rice chart and you know terminology there. One other thing that I forgot to mention is x meaning solubility. Well, as the value of x increases, all right, so as the value of x increases, then that means that the solubility increases as well. So value of x increases, your solubility increases as well. So I've seen a couple of multiple choice questions where they ask that conceptually. So what I would have to do is solve for x, meaning solubility, and as that value increases, the solubility of that particular um, solvent, or, or I'm sorry, not solvent, but solute increases as well. So when we're discussing KSP, we also look at Q versus K for this um, particular equilibrium as well. But again, we have a special meaning here. When we did Q versus K for general equilibrium with KC and KP, all that basically predicted is which way the reaction will shift to make equilibrium. In this case, it has a little bit more of a specific approach. You are predicting of whether or not a precipitate will form. All right, so we need to talk more terminology here. Lots of terminology with KSP. So you have unsaturated solution, saturated solution, and a supersaturated solution. So what do those terms mean? An unsaturated solution means that you have not reached equilibrium yet. You can dissolve more of that solute. So basically, your reaction still needs to go towards the products in order to achieve equilibrium. In the center here, you see a saturated solution. A saturated solution means that your Q, which is your initial values, is equal to K. All right, Q is equal to K. So you're at equilibrium if it is saturated. What that means is you're kind of at a threshold where I've that solvent has held as much of the solute as it can. If it gets any more of the solute inside the solvent, then you will form that precipitate there. A supersaturated solution means that you've gone past equilibrium. If you've gone past equilibrium, you need to, your, the reaction is going to shift towards the reactants. And remember that these are your ions here, these are your aqueous on the product side, and this is your solid that's on the reactant side. So I'm making more ions here for unsaturated. I am forming a precipitate here if it is supersaturated. So a precipitate forms if I have something that is supersaturated. So how do I use this knowledge and use K to figure out if a precipitate will form or not? Well, Q, just like Q before, is the initial value. So I use the same equilibrium um, expression, but instead of K, I'm going to use Q. Q is initial values. So if Q is greater than K, so if Q is greater than K, then that means a precipitate will form. You have what we call a super saturated solution. Know this terminology, be able to discuss that in the free response. So if Q is greater than K, you see, just like before, I'm going to have to shift to my K value. I have a supersaturated, and yes, a precipitate will form only then. If Q is equal to K, supersaturated, uh, I'm sorry, not supersaturated, but just saturated, and that means I'm at equilibrium. And if Q is less than K, then that means that the reaction will need to shift towards my ions to reach equilibrium. So therefore, I can dissolve more of my solute there. 
Now, there are some harder questions dealing with Q versus K. So I have a little side note here. Don't forget the dilution equation. So what that means is if they give me um, a volume, so let's just say 30 milliliters of a certain molarity, so 0.1 molar of whatever, all right, let's just call that A, and they say that we're mixing it or we're adding it, to let's say 50 milliliters of um, 0.2 molar B. What I'm doing is I'm mixing two solutions. So one thing is coming from one solution, the other is coming from another solution. Whenever I'm mixing or adding two solutions, I first have to figure out my new molarities. So new molarities for both ions, okay? In order to do that, I use the dilution equation, which is M1 V1 equals M2 V2. Now let me explain what all these mean. M1 means the initial molarity. So I would plug in, let me get a different color so I can point it out. I would plug in this 0.1 molar right here for M1. V1 means initial volume that I have before I mix. So this first section here means before I mix, before I add them together. So M1 and V1 will be on this side. Now M2 is the new molarity that I'm solving for, and V2 would be the new volume once we've mixed. So once we mix these two, I have 50 milliliters and 30 milliliters, so that will be a total of 80 milliliters there. So I'm going to solve for M2 for A. I'm also going to solve for M2 for B, and those values are what I'm going to plug in for my Q expression, okay? The only time when I have to do this, and they like to give this to you a lot in the free response, is if it says a molarity and a volume of something is mixing or being added to a molarity and volume of something else, and then asking if a precipitate will form. That is the only time when you have to use this dilution equation before you can plug it into the Q expression. So I hope that um, makes sense to you guys. On this slide, I want to talk about Le Chatelier with KSP and something called the common ion effect. So we already know about temperature. Just like the other Ks, um, temperature can change K. So remember that even KSP is temperature dependent. Okay, so let's talk about, um, I'm going to give you some examples. So the mathematical approach isn't used yet. I'll just write some examples here. Let's say I have A solid breaking up to B plus plus C minus. So that's solid, my aqueous things there. Let's say that this reaction is endothermic. So endothermic means heat is a reactant. If I increase temperature, my reaction will shift to make more ions. So they can ask this in terms of will it be more soluble or will it be less soluble? Anytime I am shifting towards my ions, you are always going to be more soluble. All right, your solution will be more soluble. Anytime I'm shifting away from my ions, your solution becomes less soluble because you're shifting towards that solid, less soluble, you're starting to form that precipitate. Okay, so temperature is um, dependent on whether or not you have an endo or exothermic reaction. If it was exo, heat would be on my product side. You guys should be good with this. If you have questions on the temperature effect in endo and exo, you should watch the general equilibrium Le Chatelier video. And how does that affect my K? Well, if my, I'm shifting to my products, I'm making more products, so K 
will increase. So working with KSP and temperature is the same exact way as you would work with KC and KP. It's just sometimes they can add that extra word, will this be more soluble or will this be less soluble? So always remember, if I'm shifting towards my product side, you are becoming more soluble because you have more ions there. Now, number two, increasing or decreasing pH. Let's do this one in red. pH, um, when I increase or decrease pH, I'm either adding H pluses or I'm adding OHs. If I increase pH, I'm adding OHs. If I decrease pH, I'm adding H pluses. And this is something that will make more sense when we do get to the acid base unit after Christmas. So when I'm working with pH, I have to have something that is an H plus or an OH that is in my reaction. So let's just say MgOH2, that's my solid. And that's breaking into Mg2 plus plus 2 OH minus. So we're working with this reaction here. So let's first talk about what would happen if I increase pH. So remember, increase pH means I'm adding OHs. So you see how I have OHs here, right? So if I add more OHs, we already kind of know what's going to happen here. I'm going to shift to the left, shift to the reactants. If that's the case, I'm shifting towards this solid here. So my reaction is going to be less soluble. I'm going to be starting to form that precipitate. Okay. But what if, let me use um, pink for this. What if I add H pluses and I can add H pluses by decreasing the pH? Well, if I add H pluses here, guess what's going to happen? H pluses and OHs, whenever they come together, they form water. So basically, this stuff here is going to be depleting itself. It's going to be decreasing to form water. So if I decrease, how does my reaction shift? Well, your reaction will shift to make more ions. And if I'm making more ions, if I'm shifting to the products, then your reaction, or not your reaction, but your solution is becoming more soluble because I'm making more of those products. So that is the effect on pH if you're increasing or decreasing. Now the same would happen if I had an H plus in my reaction. Um, if I had an H plus and I added H plus, I would shift away. If I added OHs, then I would be making water, so I'd be decreasing H pluses, so it would be shifting towards that decrease. So make sure you guys pay attention to pH and how that can affect solubility. The last thing that we're going to talk about is the common ion effect. So let's say we have this reaction here. Um, we have PbCrO4 solid going to Pb2 plus plus CrO4 2 plus. Um, that should actually be a 2 minus. So they have a little bit of a typo here. Um, so oh, that's going to bug me. Here we go. 2 minus. This is why I don't like pulling things from the internet, but it saves me time. So whatever. Um, so if I increase Pb, all right, if I increase this value here, what that is going to do is going to shift towards my solid, okay? This is something known as the common ion effect. Now, it might not be just PB2 plus that they add. They might be adding PBCl2 to that, all right? Well, you say, well, what's common between this stuff and this stuff? Well, what's common is the PB, so that's why I'm adding the PB there. So this is the common ion effect. Now they love to ask this mathematically in both free response and multiple choice as well. So Le Chalier's principle, you just add it like I'm, I'm increasing this, my reaction is going to shift to the reactants in this case, so therefore it's becoming less soluble because I'm making the solid present there or whatever. Okay. Now they might say, well, what if I add in a NaCl? Um, 
Hold on, I gotta get my berry steak. Sorry. So they might say, let me write a reaction now first. All right, sorry, I got a reaction now written down, so I've got my bearing straight. So let's say we have PBCl2 goes to PB2++ 2Cl-. And let's say that we want to add some amount of NaCl to this whole solution, all right? And we want to know what will the concentration of PB2 plus be. So here's how I work this out. I write this out just like I would any other rice chart. So PB2 plus is zero, Cl minus is zero initially. This would be plus X, and this one would be plus two X. And so this expression here would be X, this would be two X, and I would have some KSP um, expression and value. So my KSP expression would be PB2 plus, times CL minus, and that value is squared. So let's say specifically I added 0.5 molar NaCl to our solution. All right. Now, this is a common ion question. How do I know that? That's the first thing. How do I know this is a common ion question? Well, the reason why I know this is because I have a reaction, PBCl2, PB2+, 2Cl-, and I'm adding something to it. And what I'm adding to it has something in common with what I have in the reaction here. So the Cl here and the Cl here are what is in common. So that's why I know it's a common ion effect question. Now secondly, what do I do with this? This value here, the common ion value, always replaces whatever this expression is. Now, it doesn't say 2x is equal to that number. This totally replaces this value, whatever 2x would be. The reason why is because this value, 0.5 molar, is going to be so much larger compared to whatever 2x's quantity is. So this supersedes, this kind of trumps um, the 2x that we have present here. So now, if I know that this equilibrium value is 0.5 molar, because the common ion, we totally re replace what would be in our E value. This is now 0.5. I would be given a KSP value, so I'd be given some number there, so I could solve what this PB2 plus value is. All right. So this is how I mathematically work these common ion questions. First of all, how do I know it's a common ion question? It's because they will give me some compound and tell me that I'm adding something that has an ion in common. And then how do I work that out? Well, that value that it gives me will totally take place of whatever would be in my rice chart. All right, so that's how we work common ion questions. So we're on to our last slide now, and I call this the solubility race. But what they do is they give you two different compounds. So in this case, they're giving me PBI2 and CUI. So they're telling me I have two different compounds and they will give me two different KSP values as well. So they'll give me this compound with its KSP value and this compound with its KSP value. And I might also give you the concentration of PB2 plus and the concentration of Cu plus. So they're giving you lots of information here. And they say, all right, well, if that's the case, which one of these guys is going to precip pre precipitate first? So here's what you do. In order to answer this question, which one of these will precipitate first? They might be saying, hey, well, what's common between these? Well, we have I here and we have I minus here. Okay, so the common thing between these is I minus. So they might say that we're adding NaI to both solutions. So we're adding NaI to that solution, we're adding NaI to that solution.
And then that gets the solubility race going. We're trying to figure out which one will cause the, the precipitation first. So our first step here is to write each reaction. And that's what I did right here. So PBI2 and CUI, I wrote its reaction. So you're doing this for both things. Step two, you write each KSP expression. So this is step two. I wrote the KSP expression for that one. I wrote the KSP expression for that one. Step three, I solve for the common ion. So again, I said that I was given the KSP expression, or I'm sorry, not the KSP expression, but the KSP value, and I was given PB2 plus's equilibrium concentration. I was also given this KSP value and this equilibrium uh, concentration. So what I'm going to do is plug that information in and solve for I minus for both of these. Now don't forget that this one's squared because there's a 2 there. So it's easy to forget that you're squaring those values and all that. Just make sure you pay attention. So step 3 is I'm solving for the common ion for both of them. Now I'm going to compare these two values. And once I compare those two values, whichever is in smallest concentration, that is the one that will precipitate first. So the smaller common ion concentration will precipitate first. Now rather than just memorizing these steps and why you're doing it, let's understand or, or memorizing the steps and you know trying to figure out what to do. Let's let's understand why we're doing this. When I write a KSP expression and when I'm solving for this concentration of I, that is the amount of I needed to become saturated. Now, if you remember from previous slides, saturated means that you have reached equilibrium. If you've reached equilibrium, any amount over that quantity will then form a precipitate. So basically, you're solving for how much I need to saturate your solution here, how much I you need to saturate your solution there, and then whichever is the smaller amount, if I just put a pinch more than that quantity, then that's when your precipitate will be formed. So they can also ask this in terms of what concentration would it be if I need to form a precipitate? And your answer would be any concentration over the quantity that you find here. So any concentration over the quantity you find here will tell me how much iodine that I need in order to form a precipitate. So I call this the solubility race. That's definitely not the technical term, but um, they like to ask this question in some free response. So KSP really isn't that difficult. It is very similar to KC and KP. The only differences that we have here is that some terms are a little bit different and we have lots of new definitions we have to remember and be able to incorporate. So I hope this was helpful and good luck with KSP.